I just love that countdown. It's so creative. It's brilliant, isn't it? Well, welcome on this Palm Sunday and uh, the start of what we know to be Holy Week. Uh, that week when Je Jesus made his final journey to the cross. And uh, we remember on Palm Sunday that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey with the crowd shouting, Hosanna, uh, which means praise or save us. So it's both an exclamation of praise, but also request, save us. And of course, they wanted him to be their king. And uh, there was Jesus on the way to the cross. But we have the privilege of being the other side of the cross, don't we? And we can shout Hosanna. We can shout our praises this morning, knowing that Jesus has saved us. What a privilege that is. And we can recognize him this morning as king of our hearts. So we're going to do that. We're going to stand. If you'd like to stand, we're going to um, say a psalm together. And uh, we'll use this. Imagine you're in the crowd, but you're cheering Jesus on as the one who has saved you. And uh, we're going to say together some words from Psalm 118, uh, the first verse, and then verses 19 to 29. I invite you to um, speak out uh, with praise in your hearts, the green and the red, and then I'll say the black. All right, so the green and the red are for you and I'll say the black. So let's go together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Open with me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Oh, there should be one more. <laughs> okay, I'll say the rest. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal pr procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and, and I, I will give, give you thanks. thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you are good and your mercy is endless. As we stand at the start of this week, when your church remembers Jesus's passion and death, forgive us, Father, that we are often distracted by many things. And we pray that you'll quieten our hearts now and help us to focus on the one who comes in your name. In Jesus, who opens the gates of righteousness and answers when we call. Lord God, thank you for shining your light on us, for sending your son in human frailty to the walk the road we walk and to suffer in our place. Open our eyes that we may see him coming and praise him with pure hearts. We praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. So let's uh, join our praises together. Um, do sit or stand through the worship as we're led. Come, let us worship our King.
Amen. That was great, wasn't it? Great lifting up our risen Savior. Praise his name. Hey, it's great to see, um, just to be together, isn't it? God's family worshiping to, together. Let's not give up meeting together. And uh, we look forward to being back in our building in uh, GBC, don't we, um, down at East Chadley Lane. Well, we've come a long way in Mark's Gospel. You may remember that way back in January, three and a half months ago, we started our overview of Mark's Gospel and just working our way through. And uh, we watched uh, a video just giving us that overview. Uh, You may remember it was a long time ago. But I thought it'd be really good to remind ourselves how far we've come and to remind ourselves too what we've been learning as we've been working our way through. We've just got two more sessions now, today, Palm Sunday, and then next Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, we celebrate the grave being open and the resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to re-watch that overview and uh, just remind ourselves, just let those things percolate as we um, watch the video. And then Nikki's going to lead us as we read God's word together. The Gospel According to Mark is one of the first accounts of the life of Jesus, and our earliest historical traditions link this book to a Christian scribe named Mark, or John Mark. He was a co-worker with Paul and a close partner with Peter. And in fact, an ancient church historian named Papias, he recalls that Mark had collected all of the eyewitness accounts and memories of Peter and then shaped them into this account. But Mark didn't just randomly throw the pieces together. He's carefully designed this story of Jesus. In the first line of the book, Mark makes this claim about Jesus. It's the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, what's interesting is that this is the only time Mark is going to tell you what he thinks. For the rest of the book, he's going to influence you by simply putting Jesus' actions and words in front of you and showing you how other people react to him. Now, Mark's designed the story of Jesus as a drama with three acts. The first one set in Galilee, the third one is set in Jerusalem, and the second act shows Jesus on the way from one place to the other. And each of the acts focuses on repeated themes. So in Act 1, everybody's blown away by Jesus, and they're wondering, who is this Jesus? In Act 2, it's the disciples who are struggling to understand what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. And then in Act 3, we watch the surprising paradox of how Jesus becomes the Messiah King. Let's just dive in, and you'll see how it unfolds. After the opening line, Mark begins with a quotation from the ancient prophets Isaiah and Malachi, who said that God would send a messenger to Israel to prepare them for when God would show up himself to rescue his people and become their king. Mark introduces John, the Baptist, as that messenger, and then right when you expect God to show up personally, Mark introduces Jesus. And as he comes onto the scene, the heavens open, God's spirit descends on Jesus, and God says, you are my beloved son. After this, Mark places in front of us a summary of Jesus' core message. He went about Galilee, announcing the good news that God's kingdom has come near. Jesus is carrying forward the story from the Old Testament scriptures about God's rescue operation for his world. Through Jesus, God is restoring his reign over the world by confronting and defeating evil and its hold on people's lives. And then by inviting them to live under his reign by following Jesus. From here, Mark's given us a big block of stories showing us Jesus' power as he brings God's kingdom. He goes about healing people whose bodies are sick or broken or under the oppression of dark spiritual powers. And Jesus even does something that for Jewish people, only God has the right to do. He forgives people's sins. And Jesus' actions here produce lots of different responses. So some people follow him and become his disciples. Other people don't know what to think, and still others reject him completely, especially Israel's leaders who accuse him of blaspheming God and being empowered by evil. But Jesus isn't surprised by these responses. In fact, he draws attention to it. In chapter 4, Mark has collected many of Jesus' parables about the hidden, mysterious nature of God's kingdom. And Jesus says that his message is like seed falling on different types of soil. Some are receptive, some are not. Or it's like a mustard seed that's very tiny, it seems insignificant, but then it grows huge and surprises everyone. Jesus' point is that he really is the Messiah, bringing God's kingdom, but it doesn't look like what anybody expected. 
And this growing confusion about Jesus among the crowds is connected to a key idea Mark emphasizes at the end of Act 1, that even among Jesus' disciples there's confusion. Even they are struggling to grasp who Jesus really is, and that brings us to Act 2. It begins with a crucial conversation. Jesus takes the disciples aside and he asks, who do you all say that I am? And Peter speaks up, saying, you're the Messiah. But it becomes clear that for Peter, this means that Jesus is a victorious military king from the line of David who will rescue Israel from the Romans. But for Jesus to be the Messiah means that he's the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53, who will bring God's rule by giving up his life in Jerusalem. And the disciples, they don't get it. They think following King Jesus is going to mean fame and status and importance. And Jesus makes it clear that following him is actually like dying, like carrying your own cross. It means rejecting violence and pride and selfishness and giving one's life out for others in acts of service and love. He has the same conversation with them two more times. And it all culminates in Jesus' important statement that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to become a servant and give his life as a ransom for me. The disciples still don't get it. They respond in confusion. So and so here in Act 2, Mark has placed another key story that echoes the book's introduction. Jesus takes three of his disciples up to a mountain, and he's suddenly transformed. He's radiating with light and glory, and a cloud envelops him. Now, this is just like the glory of the God of Israel that showed up long ago on Mount Sinai. And then the two prophets who stood in God's presence on Mount Sinai, Moses and Elijah, they appear next to Jesus as God announces again, this is my beloved son. Now, by placing this story in the middle of all these conversations in Act 2, Mark is making an astounding claim that Jesus, God's son, is the physical embodiment of God's own glory. And in Jesus, the glorious God of Israel is going to become king by suffering and dying for the sins of his own people. It's a puzzling claim that confuses and scares the disciples as they leave the mountain. Which brings us to Act 3. Jesus makes a very public royal entry into Jerusalem for Passover. People are hailing him as the Messiah. Then he enters into the temple courtyard and he asserts his royal authority by running out the thieves and crooks and stopping the sacrificial system. Then this kicks off a whole week of Jesus debating and confronting the leaders of Israel, condemning their hypocrisy. And so they set in motion a plan to have him killed. And Jesus warns his disciples, predicting that Jerusalem and its temple will be destroyed within a generation. And his disciples will be persecuted just like him until he returns one day to bring God's kingdom fully over the world. And it all leads up to the final night. Jesus has his last Passover meal with the disciples, a symbolic meal that told the story of Israel's liberation from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And Jesus takes these symbols and he gives them new meaning. They point to the liberation from sin and death that will happen through the death of the suffering servant Messiah. From here, the story rushes forward to Jesus' arrest, his trial before Israel's priests and the Roman governor Pilate, all resulting in Jesus' crucifixion. And it culminates in a key scene that matches the important scenes from Acts 1 and 2. Except this time, it's darkness that descends, not a cloud. And instead of the divine voice from heaven, it's Jesus' voice crying out before he dies. And then most surprising is that it's a Roman soldier who sees Jesus die, who grasps and then announces who Jesus is. This man was the Son of God. He's the first person in the story to recognize the story's shocking claim about Jesus' identity, that it's the crucified Son of God who's the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, who died for his friends and for his enemies. After this, Jesus' body, body is placed in a tomb, and on the first day of the new week, two women from his disciples come to the tomb, and they discover that the tomb is empty, the stones rolled away. And an angelic man informs them that Jesus isn't here, that he's risen from the dead. And so he orders them to go and tell this good news to the other disciples, that Jesus is alive, that he'll meet them back up in Galilee. And the women, they're freaked out. Mark says that they fled from the tomb in terror, telling no one, for they were afraid. And that's how the book ends, with Jesus' disciples showing the same kind of fear and confusion that concluded Acts 2 and 1. Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll see that the Gospel of Mark has more to its ending. 
where Jesus appears, he speaks to his disciples. But there's also a note there telling you that that ending is not part of the original book, that it's only found in later, less reliable manuscripts. Now, it's possible that the original ending got lost or that Mark actually never finished writing his account, but it's more likely that this abrupt ending is intentional to make a point. The entire story has focused on the shocking claim that puzzled Jesus' disciples from beginning to end, that it's the suffering, crucified, and risen Jesus who's the Messiah, the Son of God, that God's love and upside-down kingdom were revealed as Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so this story ends without closure, and it forces you, the reader, to grapple with this very strange and scandalous claim about Jesus. And are you going to run away like the disciples? Or are you going to recognize Jesus as your king and go and tell the good news. And only you can answer that question. And that's what the Gospel of Mark is all about. Our reading today is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thank you so much, Nikki. Let's pray for Daniel as he, um, we're going to worship again. Um, Daniel will come after um, we sing. So let's pray for him as he brings God's word to us. Father, we very simply pray that you will open our eyes to see more of you this morning. Speak to us through your word. May your word go into our hearts. Lord, may we take hold of that word and act upon it so that it makes a difference in our lives and then into the lives of others that we meet. Father, bless and anoint Daniel, and uh, thank you for all the preparation he's done. We pray that you would take and use that to your glory. Amen. We're going to sing again, worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and um, the creche is on today uh, during the singing. If the youngsters would like to go out, then please feel free to follow Liz that way. Um, let's worship together. Let's stand or sit as you feel. Splendor of the King, God in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in love, and darkness cries to hide. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, good to be able to be here uh, together and um, for us to be able to worship God, um, to encourage each other, encourage each other by being here, encourage each other by um, being able to uh, worship together. Um, definitely is a blessing for me when I don't have to just hear my voice. Um, it's good to hear others as well. Uh, as we said, uh, thank you, Nikki, for our Bible reading. Uh, we're coming to the end of our series, uh, looking at the book of Mark. And um, this week and next week, I'm going to try not to say too much about next week because otherwise I give the game away. Um, you might already know what that is, um, and that's good. Um, but if not, um, why not come next week and find out um, what it is? Um, and perhaps you're watching online. Perhaps you're watching on YouTube later on Sunday or during the week. I um, encourage you to come and um, be here on Easter Sunday. Um, there's plenty of space here. Uh, why don't we try and um, fill the building as it was, fill the seats together, um, be able to come and, um, and celebrate, I've told you a little bit, celebrate uh, next week, Easter Sunday, together. We're nearly, as I say, at the, book, at the end of the book of Mark and the series that we've been looking at. And right through uh, the series, as we've looked at the book of Mark, uh, we've been thinking about um, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God coming. And uh, Mark, as he writes this book, um, has in mind, um, as, as we've just watched on that video, right at the beginning, Mark 1.1. Mark tells us what's, it, what's going on, that this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The good news, let's keep that in mind as we think about um, Palm Sunday, that this is good news. It might be news that you've heard before, it might be news that you've um, thought about many times before, um, and it's perhaps news that just becomes normal news, or perhaps it's news um, that's become old news. But I pray that we would remember again, that we'd be um, re-enlightened with the fact that this is good news. And in the words of that short video that we've um, just watched again, this is the beginning of Act 3. We're right at the beginning of Act 3 as Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem. Um, the prep work has been done. Um, he has got to this point and we're ready for this part of the story. Mark is writing, um, as uh, we know, probably speaking to Peter. Peter who was there in the midst of this all happening. Maybe at this point, as Mark's listening, you know, it feels like things are just speeded up, if that's possible. Most of the book of Mark is incredibly fast, but things are just speeded up, and, and Mark's trying to get down what's going on. And Palm Sunday, we come to the week before Easter, and we read about, Nikki's read and, um, uh, our reading, and we read about um, this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is the day where the branches are taken from the fields and they're laid out in front of um, Jesus as he comes in Jerusalem. People are shouting and screaming. People are not screaming angrily, but they're so excited. Sometimes when we read things in our own mind, we can read things um, without very much volume. I don't think this was a quiet affair. This wasn't something that just sort of happened in the background. This was triumphant. The people had got themselves really excited. They believed that this was the moment. Some of the people would have been following Jesus for um, the last perhaps couple of years. They would have heard about what's going on. They'd been aware of it. They were thinking, what is about to happen? They'd got in their mind that Jesus, he was someone important, but maybe, just maybe he was the king. Maybe he was the king who was going to come. The people gathered there, that's what they believed. They'd got themselves into a moment where they thought that this was Jesus. This Jesus was the Messiah in the line of David. They called out, Hosanna, as we've heard, save us. Hosanna, you are the one. They've called out, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. A kingdom comes when a king comes. And here was Jesus, the king, in the line of David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They'd believed. They'd got to a point where they dared to speak out. Jesus, perhaps he came from heaven. Perhaps this is, this is the moment. 
So there's Jesus. He, he, he's on the donkey. He comes into Jerusalem. People are so excited. We can only guess what perhaps they thought might happen next. Perhaps they'd imagined that he was going to go down to the temple and call down fire from heaven. Perhaps the stories of the Old Testament were in their minds where, where God moved in power. And they were ready for this to happen. Maybe some of the plagues from um, the, the Exodus um, were in their minds. The things that God did, these amazing things, and it was like it was going to change everything. And maybe they, they were there, they'd welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. And they were ready for the next bit. And as we know, Jesus went to the temple, and maybe many followed. And there they were going, yes, I'm going to follow you. This is it. This is the moment. Perhaps some of them were looking sideways, trying to find a, a Roman soldier, waiting to see what happens to these invaders. Maybe they were all going to drop down dead. Maybe something amazing was going to happen. Their excitement levels, they're there, they're ready. It's all going to happen. And then we read, it was a bit late, so Jesus went back to Bethany. And they would have just, well, what? Some of them maybe thought, well, maybe it'll be the next day. That can't be it. You know, this is, this is it. This is the moment. This amazing entry. Surely it wasn't just to pop to the temple, have a look around, and go back out again to Bethany. Maybe for some of them, they'd started to get frustrated. What? what? Maybe some of them, in that moment, stopped believing. No, Jesus wasn't who we thought he was. Jesus wasn't the next that the king come in. Maybe that's why in those short five days there's such a change of atmosphere um, in Jerusalem. That on Palm Sunday as, as Jesus comes in on that donkey, they're not, they're not just like having a little bit of a, oh, there's someone on a donkey, that's good. They are celebrating. They are crying out. They are worshiping. They're, everything in them is like, this is the moment. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the moment where things are going to change forever. And as I say, there they go. This Jesus who has healed the sick, he's brought dead back to life. He's spoken words of incredible wisdom. He's cast out demons. He's spoken those words, your sins are forgiven. Everything is there. They're so hopeful for this moment. And then he returns back to Bethany. Think about those disciples. Peter, who's probably told Mark this story. Now, Peter's telling Mark all of this after it happened. So Peter's along the journey as we are. But, but when it's happening, there's Peter who, who probably, as we know, believes that Jesus was going to be some sort of... Um, king that was going to come and remove the Romans. This was a king who was going to come in authority, in power, and things were going to change. Peter and the disciples were there at this moment, and maybe they were starting to think, well, what is going on? Maybe Peter had spent enough time with Jesus up to this point to realize things didn't always work out the way that you expected with Jesus. Jesus didn't do things the way that maybe Peter would have done things or the way that we would do things. And maybe there was enough within Peter to say, okay, let's carry on. Let's see what happens next. And for us, as we're looking at the book of Mark, thinking about the importance of God's kingdom, and over the last few weeks as we've thought about um, what it means for us in the way that we live now, the, the way that we, in our, in our personal lives, in our families, in our homes, in our work lives, in the places we socialize, in the virtual places that we find ourselves, how do we bring God's kingdom? What is our role as we think about that? And over the last few weeks, as we thought about that, we thought it's the importance in the way that we live, in what we say, in what we do, and how we do it. When we stand alongside our friends, our neighbors, our family in times of hardship and the way that we respond in those times. Sometimes maybe bringing the kingdom of God is by praying along with people. It's by perhaps cooking a meal or a cake for someone. 
It's phoning them, sending them a message. It's praying for healing and breakthrough in people's lives. It's by giving to people in need, speaking out for justice and truth. When we do these things, we're acting the way that God wants us to. We're acting part of God's kingdom. We're, we're living it the way that God wants us to. God's the king. When we recognize him as king, when we say, God, you are king, we then have to live by his rules. We live by his model. We live by the way that he wants us to. But we have to be really careful. We have to be really careful that it doesn't shift the focus. It's not about us living our kingdom. It's not my kingdom. It's not the kingdom of God Manchester Baptist Church. We must come back to over and over again, this is about God's kingdom. This is God's kingdom. And when Jesus was on that donkey riding Jerusalem, it was about God's kingdom that he was bringing in that moment. And that's what people believed. They may not have understood how it was going to happen, but they wanted God's kingdom to come, his rule, his reign. Jesus is king. Now, I want us to, um, just for a moment, you might have to use your imaginations. Um, it depends um, if you've seen the film Shrek or not. Bear with me. But I want you to imagine for a moment that the donkey um, talks, okay? So the donkey that Jesus is on um, is able to talk. If you haven't seen the film Shrek, the donkey in the film can talk, in case you wonder where the link is. Um, now, we know it's not the same donkey, um, but um, for a moment, I just want you to imagine, after... Um, Jesus has got off, and Jesus carries on to the temple. Um, the donkey wanders off. We don't really need to read any more about the donkey, so I can be a little bit creative. The donkey wanders off, find a whole load of donkey friends who also talk, and has a bit of a conversation with them, okay? And the donkey says something along the lines of, did you see that? Did you see what just happened? Everyone was shouting and screaming, Everyone was ripping branches from the trees. Everyone was so excited. Did you see how everyone was treating me? And the other donkeys are like, yeah, it was amazing. We could hear it all the way from over here. It was phenomenal what was happening. And that donkey says, yeah, yeah, I know. I am amazing. Uh, hang on a minute, the other donkeys say. What do you mean, you are amazing? You, you think you're amazing? Well, it's not every day, and I'd like any of you other donkeys to tell me a time, that anyone has ever ripped branches from the trees out in the fields, brought them in, and laid them down because they didn't want my hooves to touch the ground because they are special. Has any of others of you ever had crowds of people shouting, please, please save me, donkey? They were so excited. They were shouting Hosanna. I don't think any of you, that has happened to any of you. It felt so good. I am up. Oh, it is such good to be this donkey. Um, the other donkey's trying to help this donkey understand. Um, I don't think it was perhaps about you. I think it was more about um, perhaps what you were carrying. And the donkey looks a little bit inquisitive. And the donkey says, no, I wasn't carrying any, any money. I had no precious cargo. I wasn't carrying any food for anyone. No, 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 you got it wrong. You got it wrong. This, it must have been about me. That can be about nothing else. I just had this bloke from out of town. That's all I had. It must have been about me. And the other donkeys, who are more wise and learned donkeys, we don't know why, but they are, Say, yeah, yeah, but I think you need to understand that that person that you had, that wasn't just any old person that you were carrying. You were carrying a very important person. What, really? That, that wasn't about me, says the donkey, very disappointed. And the other donkeys say, yeah, that person was Jesus. He is the king. The king? Oh, 
That makes a bit more sense then. We'll leave it there. Obviously, the donkey doesn't talk. But how often do we find in our lives that we end up making it more about us than about Jesus? Today, as we think about Palm Sunday, I want you to remember, perhaps um, be told for the first time, that we are just the donkey. That Palm Sunday is amazing. And the donkey's really important, and we'll come to that. But the donkey isn't the main event. The donkey isn't what it's all about. I think at times we can become too big for our boots. We, we get the focus back on ourselves. There is a balancing act, but it's not about our kingdom. It's not about who we are. When we make that commitment to God and we say, God, I want to live for you. I want to live your way. I want to live by your rules. I want you to be king. We become part of God's kingdom. But it's about who we have within us. It's because of God. It's because we bring God to a situation. It's because we bring God into the lives of people. It's because we um, talk about God, speak about God, declare God that the difference comes. We do not do these things in our own strength. Not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. Too often, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves trying to do everything in our own strength, trying to be better. How can I bring God's kingdom? How can I make sure everywhere I am that everyone knows I've got to say more, I've got to do more, I've got to be more? And what it's about is that we carry Jesus, like that donkey did, to the places that he asked us to go. If on that day the donkey had decided to be a grumpy donkey and try and walk the wrong way or refused to accept Jesus as a passenger or just turned and ran in the opposite direction for Jesus to get off, then think of the story would have been different. It was important that the donkey did what the donkey needed to do. The donkey carried Jesus into Jerusalem. The donkey had a role, but it wasn't all about the donkey. And we also have a role when we think about God's kingdom. We have an important role. We carry Jesus. We carry Jesus to the places where he asks us to go. Jesus, God, chooses to do ministry and mission and ministry through people like us. God uses people like us. It's when we are present in places that we bring Jesus and his power and his presence. Jesus wants us to be in the hard places so his kingdom is there. Jesus wants us to be present in people's homes, in every home, in every workplace, in every sports hall, in every hospital, in every school, in every boardroom. Jesus wants to be on every Zoom call, in every social network. Jesus wants to be part of every important decision. And when we live the way that God tells us to, when we are part of God's kingdom, and we know what it means to live and speak his words, then we take Jesus to those places. We make a difference in those places because We are there with Jesus. When we walk alongside the sick, when we sit and talk to those who are burdened, those who don't know love, those who can't see a way forward, when we're present in those places and speak God's words and show God's love, in those times, we are like that donkey And when people that we know call out, help us, we practically, physically, the donkey physically walk Jesus in Jerusalem. But we practically and physically go and we help and we support and we listen and we care. We do it all because we've chosen to follow the king.
We do it because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Now, just like that first Palm Sunday for the Jews in Jerusalem that day, it doesn't mean that God always does it the way we expect. It doesn't always turn out the way that we would do it. And that's part of serving a king who's in charge. Sometimes things will be done differently. But God still calls us to do our bit, be part of people's lives, and they will be pa- they will be impacted. As we celebrate Palm Sunday today, and during this week, um, as we remember Holy Week and the events of Holy Week right up till next Sunday, let's remember how Jesus was treated this day. That the people were excited. The people were overjoyed. They were ready. They were so, so pleased. They knew what it meant to be part of the good news. They believed it was good news. And at times this week, it doesn't always feel, during Holy Week, it doesn't always feel like good news because of the events and what happened. But we hold on to the fact of Easter Sunday. They believed Jesus was king. Do we? They believed his kingdom would change everything. Do we? Do we take Jesus into places or do we doubt the power that he can make? Jesus is still king and his kingdom still changes everything. The donkey wasn't important in itself, had an important role, had an important role to bring Jesus into Jerusalem. Do you carry Jesus into every place? Or sometimes when you walk out the door, do you Leave Jesus on the side. Is Jesus king in every place that you go? When we commit our lives to God, what we do is we put Jesus front and center of all that we do and how we do it, of all the people that we meet. Remember that you are carrying Jesus on your back. Remember that he is the king. Maybe at the end of this morning, um, you would like someone to pray with you. It doesn't have to be here. It doesn't have to be at the front. Um, maybe during this week, um, you'll think, I'd really like someone to pray with me. Give someone a call. Maybe you'd like someone to pray with you in the context of being more intentional in the way that you bring God's kingdom. To be more intentional in the fact that knowing that you carry Jesus on your back into all the places that you go. It's not your kingdom, but you have the privilege of bringing God's kingdom. Let's just pray. God, at the beginning of Holy Week and all the different emotions and reflections and thoughts um, as as we walk through this week, God, may we remember that this is good news, first of all that your kingdom is a kingdom of good news. God, thank you that that even though you don't do things the way that we would do them, God, I thank you that you are victorious, that you are the God of good. God, help us. Help us to remember that it's not us, it's you. And what a privilege that is. And God, in the places that we need to be more intentional in living your way, God, I pray that you'll give us the strength to do that. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Love your creativity. Let's um, continue in prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift up our voices in glad hosannas today and we joyfully acknowledge you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yet we know in our hearts, sincere though we may be, that our worship and commitment is sometimes as weak and shallow 
as that which greeted you as you entered Jerusalem long ago. Lord Jesus, forgive us that we go on making the same mistakes made on that first Palm Sunday. We profess to follow you, but our hearts, in our hearts we follow our own inclinations. We are self-centered in our discipleship so often. We look as much for what we can receive as give. We are preoccupied by appearances our external show disguising our inner poverty, which only you see. We're ready to serve when life is good, but reluctant when it involves the way of sacrifice. Lord Jesus, you knew as you entered Jerusalem that the welcome of the crowd would turn to rejection. Yet still you came and still you died for them and for us. And we praise you for that truth. And we thank you that you still come to us, inviting us daily to respond and share in your kingdom. Come again now into our hearts, we pray. Cleanse us of all that keeps us from you. Come to us, your church. Fill us with your love with harmony, humility, and faith. We pray that you would come to our world. In a minute, we're going to sing from pole to pole, let warfare cease and all be prayer and praise. That's our prayer, Lord. And we pray over the troubled spots in our world, especially bring before you the situation in the Ukraine the horrific atrocities that are being perpetrated there. Lord, bring your peace. Bring justice, freedom, and hope. We pray for those who are sick and troubled and in need that we know of, both here and those that we see in the news, those who are in need of your touch today, Lord. Bring your healing and hope. To them we pray. Lord Jesus, we welcome you today as Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Servant of all, the Lord of all. You are all in all, and we give you our praise. In your name. Amen. We're going to sing our last song of worship, just uh, carrying on that theme of the kingship of Jesus. We're going to sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's stand to sing.
Amen. Do have a seat. Uh, just a few notices. Um, with Holy Week, we will be just uh, having our midweek activities. Um, just we won't be having them for the week, and uh, that means no Alpha as well this week. Um, we will be having those some special prayer meetings with it being Holy Week. So um, tomorrow at um, let me get these right. Tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the evening, uh, we will be meeting in person um, down at East Chadley Lane at our building there at GBC. So 8 o'clock tomorrow night. And then on Tuesday morning at 10 in the morning, we'll be meeting in person for a prayer meeting as well. So Monday night, Tuesday morning. And then on Wednesday evening, we'll be having the usual um, 8 o'clock prayer meeting on Zoom. So if you'd like the Zoom details, then do get in touch with the office. So that's three special prayer meetings this week. And then our Easter services on um, Monday, Thursday, it'll be um, 8 o'clock, no, 7.30, no, hang on, <laughs> get it right. Uh, Monday, Thursday, 7.30, 7:30. <laughs> I knew all these dates, 7.30, and then um, 8 o'clock in the morning um, up here. So all our Easter services will be up here. As Daniel said, we'd love loads to come. So 7.30, uh, Monday, Thursday, uh, up here. And Joe will be leading us um, just exploring the elements of a Passover, the Passover meal. And um, that's going to be a great time. So do bring others to that as well. We'd love that to be well supported. And then um, on Good Friday uh, morning, at eight o'clock in the morning, um, up here as well. I just keep checking with Daniel. <laughs> eight o'clock in the morning, up here. So bright and early start, but it'd be great to start Good Friday together, wouldn't it? Um, just reflecting uh, on the cross and all that means to us in our daily lives. So that's Good Friday. And then 10.30, great Easter celebration here next Sunday. Woohoo! And uh, then we have our Easter songs of praise that will be going out at four o'clock on the YouTube channel as well. And um, as we were saying when we recorded it, we can't fail to realize that Jesus is alive. Um, we just lift up his name through that service. So lots there to encourage your friends and neighbors to get involved in as well. Um, we do take it as a, a privilege to be able to give to God's work. The Bible tells us that everything that we have, even our ability to work, comes from God. And so when we give, we give back to his um, work in the world. And that is an immense uh, responsibility and privilege. So if you'd like to give, uh, if you don't give already through the banking system, but if you'd like to give, then uh, we have the um, baskets available for you. Let me finish with uh, a verse from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So do stay for coffee. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, then come on to these um, front rows here. We'll turn the cameras off and somebody will come and pray with you. Do stay, mix and mill, get to know your people. Talk to somebody you don't know. How about that? Before you talk to somebody you do. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Thank you. Bless you and have a wonderful Easter.